So good afternoon. Tara, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Right. Uh, this is uh, just a, a pre-technical uh, introduction. Uh, we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Stephen Kitwelder of the Jason McCoy Gallery in New York. And we're together today in conversation with the artist Tara Gear, hosted by Stephanie Booman and Amanda Konishi. The visual presentation will be best seen on Zoom's standard view. Located on the upper right of your screen, click on view and scroll down to standard view and that should format you properly for the presentation. Also, please note that the entirety of this conversation will be available on YouTube. So if you have tef technical difficulties, bear, bear with us and revisit us on YouTube. One last technical request. During the presentation, we ask that everyone please keep your audio on mute. To do so, find the mic icon on the lower left of your screen. With your cursor, tab on the mic icon and your audio is mute when a red bar is seen over the mic icon. Further, just to the right of the mic icon, lower left of your screen, is the video icon. Please tab on this to red bar that icon to keep the presentation screen clear of visitors. Because this is new technology for many of us, I'll take a minute before we start. Please don't hesitate to ask for assistance and a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining what is oh. the fourth in a series of online presentations hosted and produced by the gallery's director, Stephanie Booman and Amanda Konishi, gallery registrar and manager. Please visit the gallery website to view all archived exhibitions and curatorials. Of note are our recent artist talks with Marcy Rosenblatt, Ilana Mandelson, and Balent Sako, three compelling conversations that complement their online exhibitions on Artsy and the gallery website, www.jasonmccoyinc.com. Also, please note that the comments and questions can be entered through the chat throughout the presentation and that a Q&A will follow the talk. Stephanie, Amanda, are you with us? Yes. Wonderful. Amanda, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, wonderful. Kathy, uh, Javad, uh, could you please exit the, uh, the video screen if you can? I have uh, exited. You still see me? No, you're you're exited. You're good. Okay. Are we good, Amanda? Yes, we're good. Okay, wonderful. Tara Gear was born in 1970 in Boston, Massachusetts, moving to New York in 1988. In 1993, she receives her BA double majoring with honors in art history and visual arts, magna cum laude, Columbia University. She receives membership to the Phi Beta Kappa Society and continues on at Columbia to receive her MFA in 1997. She is the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including Columbia's prestigious Lewis 
Sutler Prize, where a senior is selected annually from all art departments combined, who demonstrates, quote, excellence, the highest standards of proficiency, end quote, which begins to describe the rigor of Tara. She has received artist residencies at the McDowell Colony and numerous teaching positions, both publicly and privately, where she brings her artistic practice to apply therapeutically to psychological and physical development, as well as the traditions carried forth in the studio arts by teacher and pupil or student. Tara is a celebrated teacher, an instructor, a professor of drawing. She is almost strictly a draftsman, a drawer. It is her chosen medium. Her relationship with Andre Gregory is well documented. Her inclusion in Isabel Dervaux's 2015 exhibition, Embracing Modernism, 10 Years of Drawing Acquisitions at the Morgan Library, speaks volumes to the high regard she is held and the company of artists she is considered among. Her inclusion in Stephanie Booman's 2016 Green Box Editions, New York Conversations, 17 Women Talk About Art, sets the stage for today. Tara Gear is a rare breed of New Yorker. When visiting her upper floor studio in West Harlem, one can't help but feel that she, and certainly the building, is a vestige of old New York. The space is patinated by decades of her intense creativity, her practice, as rigorous as her art making is fraught, considered, the best of her, her works are imbued by her intelligence and the gravity of her engagement. Tara feels akin to Patti Smith, an empathy with the poet, spot on in her inflection, a predator's eye, a romantic attachment to cobblestones and inner streets. Glad to be wandering alone, she embodies New York, New York. She intuitively understands process and the process of art making, practicing the eye to the hand, to the intentional act of creating physical expression that represents an emotional need, a necessity. One knows after a short time that it must be genuine with Tara. One could easily see her as a sculptor or an installation artist. She conceptualizes space as a sculptor might, but she requires the varied material necessary to express emotion and the nuance and the directness that drawing brings to that. At this moment, I can't think of Tara Gear and be struck by perhaps the new era of art conceived, held, and sold on a non-fungible token, a digital blockchain. When with us is an artist engaged in the serious business of our human place, emotional, physical, striving to express something not readily seen, elusive within oneself. Tara Gear would describe well the essence of things. Tara lives and works with her husband, the architect Tai Ming Moi, and their two children, Jonah and Zoe. Today marks their one year retreat from New York, where by necessity, they are living in New England. It is with great pleasure that Jason McCoy and I introduced Tara Gear, a kindred artist to the spirit and history of the gallery in conversation with Stephanie Booman and Amanda Konishi to discuss her most recent body of work when the scaffolding starts to crumble. Welcome Tara.
Hi. Thank you. That was so nice. I Thank wanted you, to see <laughs> Thank you for this layered introduction and um, a little bit of biographical information. Hi, Tar. Thanks for being here today and sharing with us your work um, in this new format. But we're going to try to um, talk about details that give us all a better sense of your work in general, but also um, this recent body of work that we want to start with. And um, it has the title, When the Scaffolding Starts to Crumble, a title you gave it pretty much early on. And it's a body of work that started during the pandemic, developed during that time. And you wrote a wonderful statement for us um, a few weeks ago, where you talked about how you experienced the pandemic, how numb you felt. Stephen just mentioned some of the changes that you had to make geographically. Um, and one particular statement within that text that struck me was that you said that you felt so numb, but you also discovered that drawing was still able to teach you something. And I thought we could start with that. What does that mean? What did you learn through drawing? What was it able to teach you after years and years of dedicating yourself to this particular genre? Um, well, thank you so much for having me, first of all. I really appreciate it. And um, so, Unlike a lot of the people on Instagram and Twitter who are able to use the pandemic to be really creative and amazing, I felt like um, I wasn't drawing, I was cleaning the kitchen. And a lot of the people I knew, artists I knew, and um, particularly parents, um, and a lot of my students were not having that kind of creativity. They were traumatized and um, worried and um, doing a lot of chores and kind of, um, you know, people were mourning deaths and dealing with illness and, um, and all, it felt like I was in a, another world than the Instagram bursting with creativity world. And I, I just wasn't drawing and I have in the past been pretty good at starting again, um, which I think is kind of, if there's one skill you have in, as an artist that may be it, is just starting again. And I, I wasn't so much so, um, when I finally sat down and I, you know, I'm a teacher, I tried giving myself the diatribes I abused my students with um, and that really wasn't working. <laughs> Apparently I can dish it out, but I can't take it. Um, and finally I just sat down to draw and all of the thinking and all of the ideas and all of the anxiety, um, lift off if you just have a concrete task to do. So almost like drawing is like baking bread or something. You sit down and for me, I, I don't, it's just the same pile of charcoals and pastels. And I just had to start drawing and stop thinking. And the drawing started to kind of remind me that mm, the way that I draw is um, you know, the way all of us draw, we sit down in front of a blank page and we make some, invent something. We go forward, even though we have, you know, we just go forward. We make some moves on the page and, um, and you can never fully erase what you have. You work with what you have. That's the lesson that drawing teaches. I will say also that, um, a lot of people sit down to a page with a clear conception of what they're going to draw. And I've never been one of those people. Like I like the feeling of not knowing where I'm going. That there's like a blind path in front of me and I start to draw and that that generates the path. So that too, I suddenly remembered that, you know, I do this, like I walk down paths I can't see. Um, and that, was where the drawings had something to teach me. 
it's a very intuitive process. As you say, you kind of start blind and you go step by step. You don't know where it's leading. You're not coming with a image in mind to the blank page. Is it that you create the composition in one sitting or is it possible to go back into a composition with that kind of approach? Um, yes, yeah. so I have worked on drawings for um, really many months. I think actually I've worked, there's one drawing I've worked on for over a year, but um, sometimes the drawings just come out and I feel like it's like being a baseball player where you've practiced your whole life and then suddenly you get a home run and it's quick and fast, but it's not really the moment it takes to make the home run. It's all of the bad drawings that piled up before, then, before the home run. So sometimes they're quick and sometimes they're not. These ones, because I was trying to just unstuck myself were more about just going forward. Like I don't edit, I don't judge, I just keep moving. Um, was keep there moving. a surprise? Were you surprised by the density or were they more sparse than uh, you thought they would be? Yes, they, well, what was surprising was what I sat down to the page feeling, my idea of myself as I sat down to the page was that there I was like, I turned back into a housewife. I, you know, <laughs> cook and clean and um, yell at my kids. And, um, and that I had become numb. Like I didn't have any feelings. I didn't have anything to say. And what was quite surprising was that the drawings had a completely different story to feel like they're full of motion and very kind of like muscly or ligamenty or um, and strong and I didn't expect that so that was surprising. I'm glad you bring that word motion into the mix because it seems to me that in these new drawings there's oftentimes this wave-like movement it's almost this wave of, of forms of lines this cluster that is coming showering over us is that something that that you recognize as well? Or is that just me reading it? No, I think like, yeah. I think that when I was trying to draw in some way, just because it might've been the most immediate feeling, I was trying to draw my anxiety um, and that feeling kind of like a wave or like something rushing over you that anxiety has is just, um, pouring forward and I wanted to draw that. It didn't come out though looking as anxious. It just came out looking like vital. I don't know, do they seems look- more powerful. Anxious? It seems very energetic. It seems strong. It doesn't seem angst-ridden to me. It didn't seem like that to me when I looked at it, but I think that that was, and this is what's interesting for me about drawing is they like they tell me things that I don't know I don't like I you I sit down with what I think is a full complete notion of myself and then the drawings like have something else to say they're like that's not necessarily anxiety that could be just force we all have to use force in this world we're living in to get through it did you set yourself any other parameters? I mean, you were using materials that you're used to um, employ, but um, was there a specific size? Were there any other considerations that you kind of so during kind of framework? During the pandemic, um, I was only able to get it in where I am, this printmaking paper that I like. I, I, I It's this lovely Reeves, printmaking paper that's 20 by 30. So that's what I had. But um, also one of the kind of major misconceptions about creativity is that opening up the floodgates of possibilities is um, a useful thing. And a lot of times teachers, like if I said to all of you right now, make me a drawing, it can be absolutely anything. Use anything you want, any idea is good. Um, what happens? What do you, what do you think? Like your mind it's goes overwhelming. Blank. 
Yeah. It's mm-hmm. overwhelming. Your mind goes blank and you think like there's nothing I can do. And this is a lot of art teachers or people going into art classes think that this is, it's free and opening, but it's not. And we function better with parameters. We function better when we narrow down the possibilities. So if I say, make a drawing now using something, using a mark making implement that you have within the reach of your arms and draw something you can see from where you're sitting right now, but reverse, I don't know, the shadows or something. Then suddenly we all are in the game. We have a set of instructions and we can start to play. So that was sort of a, like a divergence from your question, but it wasn't, I don't think that it, I think, and this is maybe another lesson drawing has to teach us in a pandemic, but it's not a problem to have limited resources when it comes to artwork. And I think we live in a society where the idea is like you need more and you need better and you need more supplies and more things, but drawing you can do with a ballpoint pen on the back of a napkin. It's, it's, and that's interesting. That's its power. That's like its superpower. And um, you know, I had students, I had one student who was stuck in a room. She was from China and she was really scared and she was in a dorm where there were infections and she stayed in her room for 16 weeks. Um, so during the initial lockdown and we, I had to figure out and a bunch of students, we had to figure out, you know, what are the, what do we have and what can we do with what we have? And that's something drawing is awesome at but I think you asked me something about the format too so not just the materials but did you then get started again with a specific format because you're used to working very large too especially in your New York studio you used to have these kind of wall mounted pieces that were larger than life size and these are more intimate yeah so I had to reconfigure down to small again which i sort of did and sort of do, didn't do amanda if you go to the one the picture that has all of them on it i don't know if you can sure. but um i sort of made it like a game where i'd start one drawing and the drawing had to lead into another drawing um which is why i put them like that and you can kind of see it across the top left to right there's sort of a bridge there a kind of puffy bridge and actually in the middle one the bridge is clearer um, but so they, and I would, some of them wouldn't work and I'd throw them out and I'd put in another one and make a bridge. It was just a way, it was a kind of a gimmick, I guess, to just um, keep drawing. Well, soon as uh, we see things in sequence, we are tempted to think of narratives. Did you have a narrative in mind? The only thing I did, and this is unusual for me, was that the idea of when the scaffolding starts to crumble was my initial concept. And that every, like I would just start with that feeling, um, which is is not just the buildings falling apart, but that stuff we use to hold up the buildings falling down. (laughs) Um, And it wasn't meant to be entirely dark and disastrous, but just, you know, action is required, response is required when the scaffolding starts to crumble. So, um, when did you start working on paper and with charcoal and pastel? Because I just want to harken back to this narrowing down choices, and you haven't worked with color. If you know, of course, there's shades of gray that you know you could argue is a is a palette in itself, but you haven't really worked. Um, with chromatic choices in a long time. When did that start that you narrowed down your materials and you found your language that we're not looking at? So when I got my MFA, I was a sculptor. So Stephen was saying it looks like, it, it, it can look like sculpture. I was a sculptor, but I was a really, really bad one. And I, my, my concept of how to do everything was in paper mache. And um, that only like works really so long and so many times. Um, I had some ideas of like stringing things up, but frankly, they were just really not very good. Anyhow, I had to resort because my building skills were what they were 
and my patience was really bad too with making things. I, I wanted to like move on it and I didn't have the patience to kind of build molds and that kind of stuff. So I had to make drawings of my sculptures to, um, as a starting point. And then the drawings got more and more elaborate and the sculptures less and less elaborate. And <clears throat> also I didn't feel like I got the education I needed and when I left school, I thought that I would give myself my own education. And I assumed- well, let's see. What do you mean by that exactly? It just, um, I don't know. I mean, for anyone who's gotten an MFA, it's, it's not the most useful degree. <laughs> but even besides how it plays out in the world, it's, I got a lot of opinions from people that may or may not have been relevant. I was doing assignments that may or may not have been relevant. Mm -hmm. in, in the end, like if you're going to be an artist, you have to be able to do what you want to do, like see what you want. It's like looking down a paper towel roll. Like sometimes you can see down at the end of the paper towel, the little, the, pa the paper towel roll that, the little circle of what you're heading for and everyone else all the professors come and they make a hole down the top of it and look at the other side of the paper towel roll and can't see what you see and then say it I mean I actually people were nice to me they were encouraging it wasn't that I got bad reviews but I needed to know what I wanted to know I needed to meet my own standards and not meet anyone else's so I thought that if I started with drawing, that would be just a beginning point to sort of educating myself and like finding what I needed and go back into my studio where it's quiet and there were no opinions and no one talking to me. And I, I needed to get some of the voices out of my head. <clears throat> and so I thought I was just starting with drawing and I had some ideas about how to become proficient and what proficiency looked like. And it took me about 10 years to get to what I thought was proficient. Um, and by that point, it was just, it was sort of a done deal. Do you remember, was there a first work that kind of told you that you had arrived at uh, a place that met your standard or was it more a, a series of pieces? Well, do you remember that was, particular moment in time? I actually do, but I don't have the drawing. But the idea I had was that if I could say like do a drawing with a ton of like a drawing like this with a ton of expression and force and sort of momentary qualities expressive qualities and then I could forge that drawing so um and it looked it had the same energy to it the same force and momentariness then I then my drawing skills would be good enough like I thought it was there might have been moments where I could pull off something that looked good but if I could with conscious planning basically forge or put myself into a mindset where I could do that that those were the skills that I wanted and I remember finally doing um forging one of my own drawings and it looking like it was just done off the cuff and it taken me a long time and I was like okay and I I know how to mm -hmm. Like often we focus on sort of hand skills, like how fat is your line or whatever. But um, I'm more. I was more interested in how, like how a line has some kind of fervor to it, and if I could regularly know how to put energy into my lines, or in in the old. Chinese painting manuals, they talk about qi, the life force moving through mm -hmm. things and that you would judge a painting, not just, is it beautiful? Is it representational? The ways we tend to judge images, artworks now, but they would judge it on, does it have qi? Is there life force that comes from the world and through that drawing and goes out again? And that was one of my criteria. Do you look at your work and remember the person you were when you made them? Do you feel equally close to them? 
your different bodies of work? Hmm. Um, I have drawings like I really don't like and they make me angry. And <clears throat> you had respect, but you felt they were successful at the time? Um, I have maybe hard standards. It was actually just talking about this with my friend Lisa Reisman, who's a writer, that it's the mediocre drawings that kind of, in her case, the mediocre writing that are so frustrating because a really bad drawing you can just throw out and get over, but a mediocre drawing is like a turd you keep polishing. So the mediocre, like, and sometimes one gets stuck in something mediocre and you can't get it, like you can't, you're trying to fix it and fix it and fix it. And um, those are the ones that bother me. I, most of those I throw out, but. You said that with these new drawings, you kind of just let them sit. You didn't judge them right away. You just kind of let them happen and, and let this pour out of you. Um, at what point do you go back and edit? when something is so fresh, and obviously this is connected to a very particular time in your life, and, and we all can relate to this being a very, you know, um, special time, well, to call the least. <laughs> I know with myself, like my judgment is pretty bad um, when it, I think like I can make drawings okay, but I'm not sure. I mean, with time, like say a couple of years, if I still like a drawing, I'm sure that it's a good drawing. But I don't think, and I see it in my students too, the way that we use judgment in the moment, it's it's a highly useless um, activity in any moment of artwork. Like it seems if anything sort of hostile and abusive are ways of judging ourselves. It's like the bad, I don't know, aunt or uncle who walks in and mm -hmm. is really judgmental. And most, it's very common to have this in making work. So it's not worthwhile either listening to it as it's going on or for a while later. Maybe, I don't know what the period is. Like maybe I give it a couple months and then I say, it gets confused. Like if I feel like if I in these, I look at these and I remember, you know, it's remember how I sat down and the anger I had towards myself for not drawing as I sat down to start these, it infects the drawing sometimes. And it takes a little time for that to bleed out. And then I can see them better. Does that, I don't know if that's an answer. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been, Amanda, now it's maybe a nice um, time to go into some uh, older slides as well to show a little bit more of what Tara has been up to um, in the past few years. But have you ever been tempted to go back into an older work, not from last year, but maybe more than two, three, four years ago, now with the knowledge you have, the experience you have to alter it in a specific way? Or do you just say strictly, this is from that period? I'm going to let that stand and you always move forward. Um, so I did have this period when I was throwing out a bunch of drawings. And then I thought a lot of times it takes me a while. I like to have, it's very, the white of a page is sort of daunting. So it's nice to have, to have somewhat of a mess that you can work from. For mm -hmm. me, I guess it's nice. And um so I had I was throwing out drawings and then I thought what if I just use these as kind of the under parts of a drawing and I draw on top of them but I mean going back to the polishing the turd problem I felt like <coughs> drawings that have personalities they have like energy to them and the ones that are kind of not right their not rightness would infect forward into the rest of the drawing. At least that was what I thought. And then I threw them all out. So there's no way to really know. But Are there certain drawings that kind of stick in your memory in a particular way, maybe even in detail, not the overall composition as a, a viewer would maybe take them in if uh, seeing them for the first time, but where you really are still conscious of these underlayers that you then take away and you know you put other forms on top of it and 
this kind of, I want to call it armature almost, um, that you build in a picture like the one we're just <coughs> looking at right now. Do you keep strong memories with you at times? Of the images, certain images? Of the images and what's underneath, maybe something that's hidden to us just because it was such an intense process of making them. Not while looking at them, but do you have memories of particular drawings that just stick with you? Um, I mean, if, it, if you were a portrait painter, let's say it would be more obvious, but you know, your work is rather complicated, layered, detailed, complex, but do you still have the ability to kind of keep a memory of particular drawings? Yeah, although sometimes they bleed into each other or I've worked on them so long that I'm remembering, it's sort of like trying to remember a child as they grow, you kind of forget some parts because they're layered on by other parts. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of them actually this one, this one, was the end of many, many years of me working on a backpack that I was really interested in the folding along the side. Um, but this was like years after the backpack disappeared. But if you see along that sort of diagonal along the, that touches on the bottom of the page, mm -hmm. goes up to the right, that is kind of like this, um, it was like this, crushing and folding that happened along the side of my backpack, but it became resonant in other ways. Um, so this drawing did start with a kind of a concrete idea or image and yet an elusive one because you weren't drawing from life. You were drawing your memory of something from life. Well, probably the first year or so I was drawing from the side of my backpack, but then I washed it and I didn't like the way it, it wrinkled. <laughs> But um, the, after that, it was not good, the, the wrinkling, but um, I was drawing from life. But then what I was interested in is these little sort of origami pockets of space. Mm -hmm. And if I could draw that, like, like almost like a fortune cookie folds in a very precise space, a like I had an idea that a drawing could fold that in. And if I could draw those little folds of space. So that idea um, moved on to something maybe more metaphorical, but sometimes I, I almost always start from something I can see in front of me. No matter what I'm thinking, I um, like the normal way people describe drawing from life is that life tells you what you're supposed to draw. But I think there's like a, like a, it's a mixture. You're, what the world is telling you and what you're telling the world, it, it, it bleeds together. It's like the tide a estuary. And, and so I could go to it with this idea of folding, but look around me and see some folds or see something I could use as folding and start there. Mm -hmm. I want to um, start considering some of the uh, questions in the chat. Um, one being uh, uh, in regard to the figurative aspect of these pieces. This is maybe the perfect example because it's um, uh, through the black negative space, you kind of have a very concrete form um, that to some of us might indeed um, seem figurative. Is that something that is, um, Part of your consideration, do you even see the works as perhaps self-portraits? Um, I don't, I mean, everything that you make is a self-portrait, unfortunately, but, um, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, but so around this time, they, the drawings start having figures and actually when Trump was elected, um, I, I was, um, I started a group, we just, the weekend after Trump was elected, we, I sent out an email saying, I'm not sure what we're supposed to do, but we have to do something. And one idea we had was to protect the diversity of our neighborhood. So we started doing support for families who are getting separated. And so through the four years, um, the past four or five years, 
I was working with families who are separated. And I think before Trump was elected, drawings for me were this kind of beautiful space, like another world, even from when I was a child, like the world got quiet and still, and I, mean, I didn't hear anything going on around me. It was just like having your own magic castle. And, um, and I was having a hard time making beautiful drawings in the, in the past five years. And they, you see them, they get figurative, but they get figurative in a kind of warped way. Mm -hmm. Um, these ones aren't actually, well, they're on the wall on the left, the ones you can't see, there's slides coming up, but um, this is sort of, there's like more, um, they, more bodily. These ones maybe aren't as clearly figurative on that back wall, but mm -hmm. definitely more. Also, well, all over compositions, especially in this installation, the large pieces are kind of filling the whole picture plane. That was a, a installation at the National Arts Club in 2019. So not so long ago, but it seems like decades ago too, mm -hmm. in a different uh, world and, and place. This, yeah, and I think I was, I was in a show there too the year before, like mm -hmm. a drawing invitational um, that D. Shapiro, who I think is here, curated. But um, anyhow, this the drawings get less open these were a series called Furies. And the, this is sort of a, a horse figure. It was meant to be like the old Furies in plays that stand in audience and mm -hmm. hate everything, um, which is sort of what I felt like. But these, it was supposed to be like the head of the horse turning back and it was like barfing its own body into itself. That's sort of an ugly description, but that there was like some like way in which we're like, um, like grinding and turning into ourselves. But all of the open sort of airy sort of um, spider webby drawings stopped and they got more like this. And again, very yes. uh, particular body of work. It's kind of a wonderful treat to see, you know, uh, works from different periods of, um, of time because it shows the variety that you find in the line and the forms and the expression. And yet it's always very much your language. You know, it's, uh, it's such a very unique, um, yeah, it's, it's like a handwriting and it's a thought process and yet you find so much variety within it. Um, can you yes. tell us about this particular one and to, just to uh, maybe stay with a figurative for a second, there's, uh, such a, a foot form on the on the bottom and perhaps boat forms on the right. I mean, this seems to be one of the most figurative pieces that I've ever seen. Yeah, so this work. one was, um, this is a, about 15 or 16 feet tall and maybe um, like six feet wide. And this was the last drawing I was working on before I left. New York. This is just like a cell phone picture from my studio. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this one I had tried to start out more like the ones in the National Arts Club, kind of a more abstract piece. Mm -hmm. And it just kept turning into um, something specific. And there was one father of a, of a young girl who had gotten separated, who I've been very close to. Um, and I kept I was always thinking about him and in my mind this piece became about him because you know he left a country he was trying to be hopeful working in his country for a new person to get elected and, and this was in Honduras and he got beaten up he was with his five-year-old daughter and left in a coma and he was so scared he lost the dot he didn't know where his daughter was um and he when he woke up was able to get out of the hospital. He wanted to leave because he didn't, you know, it, it was an untenable situation. And then he comes to the border thinking, feeling hope that he's gonna make it somewhere safe and was separated from his daughter for six weeks again. Um, so anyhow, I kept thinking about him and I wouldn't intend to be drawing about him, but in thinking about the quality of his hopefulness that he kept 
trying, like trying to work for a new political party, trying to come to the border, trying to cross into the country. Once you get here thinking you would get asylum. So there's kind of the figure on the left is, I kept imagining he kept having to breathe separate air. So he has an air tank kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then sort of a hand or foot, but it keeps getting tied in. And then that creature kind of winged creature, which was a little bit like the Furies creature um, was supposed to be hope. And initially, cause he does have a lot of hope. He does maintain hope in the most adverse circumstances, but the hope was so kept getting so beaten and, um, but he was like carrying it. I kept thinking he, the weight of hope that he carries. So that's what that one was, but that was not, it wasn't like I started out trying to draw that. It just, if anything, I was trying to make a more like, you know, beautiful drawing and I couldn't. I like how you said it was, it's, uh, you were trying to capture the quality of his hopefulness. It's a portrait, but it's um, not necessarily a, a portrait of a person, but part of the essence of, of his being in this sense. Amanda, maybe we can go to that um, body of work of uh, what Tara was calling portraits. Um, and we talked a little bit about this earlier. It was actually, a, or it is a body of work that I um, didn't know and find very exciting. These are um, rather large life size or even a little bit larger than life size and um, a body of work that uh, has spanned um, several years and maybe you can talk a little bit about this because it's, it's a standalone body of work and um, they are indeed referred to as portraits. So these um, started I mean 15 or 20 years ago I had a dream in which I could see everyone's face but I couldn't I couldn't see the details of their faces but I could see that they were individuals. And I, and then I was trying to think about that. How, how do we know someone's a face or what do we see in their face? That's not exactly, that's not exactly their, like the details of their features. Like what's the personality peering out. And um, so I started drawing these and then over the years I kept doing them. But then I, I also was thinking of it like, um, um, the, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk um, Thich Nhat Hanh says everyone's, you, everyone's a unique flower in the garden of humanity. And I kept thinking about that, like how a flower, even you have a whole bunch of daisies, it grows up and they're all a different daisy. But so it was supposed to be like a stem and a bulb. And some of the bulbs blossom and some of them incompletely blossom and some of them um, just take on different shapes. So over the years, I would do these portraits that were like my flower portraits, but those are, um, you know, four feet, five feet tall. There's some other in the series that are like six feet tall. Did you envision them right away as an installation? Or was that a body of work that just grew piece by piece? Um, it grew piece by piece, but they liked being next to each other. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a couple of technical questions I also want to um, uh, put forth. Uh, one is uh, whether you work with a smooth hot press surface. I do. Um, so even though when you go to the store, what's called charcoal paper always has a tooth, I don't like the tooth because um, you can't control your line across. It's like this little bumpy surface. So I use a hot press and I, and I don't understand why the charcoal papers are sold as they are. And uh, do you use your fingers when you use charcoal? Do you push the charcoal on the paper directly with your fingers? I do. Fingers are very useful tools. Then you always have them with you. <laughs> Um, and if anybody wants to uh, speak up for the Q&A, please do so. Um, Stephen, maybe you can help me monitor the chat with the questions. Um, if there's something that I'm overlooking, uh, there's a lot of nice comments, but 
I see a question from Joan. Do you consider the white of the paper as active a mark making gesture mm -hmm. of the dark? Um, I see a dance wrestling match between the two, which is a question I, I love because I'm really interested in that. Like there's a limited number of things I can do on a black and white page. And, um, and even in like really early calligraphy classes and stuff, they say the moment you make a mark on a page, you're starting a dance between the darkness and the lightness and you're balancing that. So you don't, in calligraphy, you don't necessarily think of it like a thing you put in emptiness, but you're, you're, you're leading a dance between a balance between the dark and the light. And I like that idea. Yeah, I totally feel that. It just felt like the, the, the white marks and the dark marks are, are completely working together. And, and even how you define a shape where it, where it seems like a shape is kind of emerging out of the white void, that it's the white that sort of comes in and says, okay, this is, this is the edge, not, the, not your mark saying this is the edge. Now, does yeah. that make sense? Yes, and I'm interested in positive negative space and switching them. So I feel like it's one of the luxuries of working in two dimensions that you don't have, and this is where I was a terrible like, sculptor, Sculptors have to pay attention to gravity and rules of physicality, but the joy of drawing is that you don't. And I love like being able to push and pull um, sort of indiscriminately. <laughs> um, also, it's the sort of obvious choice to draw dark onto a light paper, and then you constantly go in that direction. But it's just as powerful and no reason to leave out drawing light onto darkness. Yeah, it almost feels like the paper was dark and then the white is coming in to, you know. Well, in point. some cases, yeah, I drew it. I've, all of these were white papers, but after drawing a long time, they have so much stuff that yeah. a lot of it is white drawn on dark. Great. Right. Tara, do you see yourself as uh, being in a dialogue with different artists or a certain era or movement, the relationships that you see with um, your work or were there particular influences? You know, I spent a lot of time looking at Chinese paint, landscape paintings, um, particularly kind of early-ish ones um, because the mark making is so various and they also aren't exactly interested. So um, illusionistic space is one set of rules, but I don't know why, like I'm more interested in ignoring those rules. Um, they're like a, it's like one track you can go on. And I was interested in the other tracks. And you see also people like outsider artists who aren't trained to lear learn standard Western illusion. They do all these cool things with space. And I, I look at those a lot. I really, really like um, when people invent their own ways of creating space. Well, these are, these are psychoanalytic drawings. I mean, I, it, was, it was something I, I wanted to say, but it just felt so obvious that, that they are. Well, that's why I got so nervous about the interview because it's like having a therapy session that goes yeah. on TV. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I... Um, I mean, I don't know. I. The, what I like, what I honor in my own drawings is when they feel like they're not, not full of crap. Like, and I feel like there's so many ways one can learn. And maybe this goes back to Stephanie, you're asking what was the problem with my education? I didn't wanna learn to make something pretty. I wanted to learn to make something that like wanted to be alive. Which sounds kind of autonomous, that you do see it as kind of an autonomous thing, that the drawing has a life of its own separate from you. 
Yeah, I do. I really do. I feel like they kind of like, that's the whole point of sitting down to draw is that then they take over and I can, when I'm thinking of it and I act like I'm in charge, then I make really bad drawings. But if I let them take over, then the drawings get really interesting. I mean, my one's own sense of control, um, and maybe this was one of the pandemic lessons too, but one's own sense of control isn't like the most interesting quality. And we, we like hunt down control and look for ways to deploy it, but it is like often when you kind of put your toes on the edge of no control. I mean, complete lack of control is a problem too, but when you can stand kind of on the brink, it's really interesting. Um, and we, we can expand our capacity. Well, that's the honesty of these pictures or of you for that matter. I think the first time we met Tara um, five years ago, first studio visit, you said something that um, struck me. You kind of uh, likened your, your drawing or a successful drawing um, to being in a relationship with a very strong dance partner where you're not always leading, but it's a back and forth. And that image always stuck with me looking at your work. I see that throughout. Right, and that's what feels fun to me. Um, or it's like biking down a hill, you know, where you're just suddenly going. It feels exhilarating. It feels like joyful. Well, thank you so much for giving us an hour. I know there's more questions we can't get to all. Um, we're happy to pass them on to Tara. If there's um, any other thoughts you have, um, you can email us and we're happy to send them forward. And um, as Stephen mentioned earlier, the talk is recorded and will be um, accessible on our YouTube channel um, in the next uh, coming days. And we'll send an email about that. But thank you, Tara, for sharing your work and especially this new body of work that we're so happy to work with and um, are allowed to help you um, bring forth in this new era of lots of uh, virtual experiences. We're trying our best to, to give them credit, but certainly hope to be able to show these drawings in person very soon as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's um, an honor and a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job. <laughs> <laughs>